what you may have noticed in all of our group theory so far is that when we talk about the order of an element of a group, it always seems to divide the order of the group itself in the case where the group is finite. Uh, and same thing with subgroups, right? So even if the, sub, the subgroup uh, wasn't cyclic, say, if we looked at its order, it just so happened that its order always divided the group, divided the order of the group. Um, and so, yeah, this turns out to be universally true. Uh, and its proof is basically just this uh, fact that cosets partition your space, right? Which I was really heavily alluding to uh, last Tuesday, right? I was like, hey, here are cosets. Notice that they form partitions and uh, all cosets have exactly the same size. So it partitions our space. And then the proof of Lagrange's theorem is basically just that. Uh, you know that nasty question? I think it was on assignment. I don't remember which assignment it was, um, but it was like G1 through G49 is not an H, uh, you know, that the order of G is not 50 uh, and all that stuff. This, this question, like if we had Lagrange's theorem, that question is so much easier, right? It's really straightforward. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah, but we didn't have it. So anyway, we will have it now. I mean, you could have used it. You just would have had to prove Lagrange's theorem. And then people would have been like, whoa, that's not, you shouldn't know that. And then the academic offense flag would go up, but whatever. All right. So before I do anything, though, maybe let me uh, recall a definition. So this is a definition that is in the book, but of course, I didn't uh, introduce it last time. Uh, but it basically is just the definition of the index of a set. So if G is a is a group and H is a subgroup of G, we define the index of G, or I guess of H in G, of H in G as this thing. And this is, this is pretty standardized notation. We definitely do use this. And it is the number of cosets, right? And in order to understand this notation, we have to recall that this thing, right? This is the collection This is the collection of left cosets, uh, in this case, uh, left cosets of uh, H in the group G. Right, so the index of G uh, of H and G is the number of left cosets. So, uh, okay, what does this mean? Why do we introduce this like crazy notation for this? I mean, the reason that we use this notation is because it generalizes quite nicely, especially especially if you start moving on into like field theory, and if you you know go and study Galois theory, you'll see this a lot more. But in the case of fields, so this is kind of like a typical algebra thing, uh, and it, this is just happens to be its application to group theory. Um, so that's you know, kind of hopefully explains away some of this notation, but this is the index, okay? And now the theorem, Lagrange's theorem itself is nothing too crazy, but it's stated in terms of the index. That, so that's why I wanted to introduce it. So this is Lagrange's theorem. Right, it's one of the big group theoretic theorems. So it says if G, I think we want it to be a finite group here. If G is a finite group, and H is a subgroup of G, then the order of G is equal to the index of H and G times the order of H, like that, okay? Now, the, the statement in the book is slightly different, but of course, it's a, a completely equivalent. I think the statement in the book basically says, oh, look, the order of H divides the order of G, but of course, that's immediately true from this statement, right? So maybe we can add that in, so in particular, the order of H must divide. Okay, you know what? Maybe let me make my divide sign a little bit bigger just to really separate it from the order notation. The order of H divides the order of G, right? Because that, yeah, that's exactly what that theorem says, right? Um, if the order of G is some number times the order of H, then in particular, the order of H is a divisor of the order of G, okay? And that's it. This seems like a relatively straightforward theorem. And yeah, it's proof isn't terribly hard. Uh, I'm not going to repeat it because I basically did all the setup for it last time. It's you look at the cosets, right? You look at the cosets generated by H in the group G, 
it forms a partition. And we know that every coset has exactly the same number of elements in its equivalence class. So you're done, right? Like that's, that's the entire proof. If you want kind of like a visual interpretation, I think that there is something nice you can do, which is basically just think about a square. Right, so let's say that this is your group G here. And all right, let's use a different color. And let's say this is, you know, this is your subgroup H, right? You know, it doesn't take up the whole space, but this is H right here. And then again, we, sh we said that if you look at all of the cosets of H, they partition your space, right? Like this. And that each of these things has the same number of elements. Let's maybe draw it so that they have four elements. Right, like, like so. Maybe let me do that a little bit faster, otherwise I'm going to be here all day. And so, yeah, the theorem just says, hey, look, the total number of elements in the, in the group are the number of cosets you have, right? That's the index of H and G. It's the number of cosets you have. Right? Times the number of things in each coset. Right? So it's just, it's basically like the area of the square is the length times its width, basically, right? So the total number of elements in G is the number of cosets times each of its cosets, uh, the size of each coset. And the reason that we know that that's true is precisely because they form a partition, right? So that's the entire, that's the entire theorem. And that's how the proof of it goes too, right? So it's, it's actually fairly straightforward. It's one of those theorems that you're just like, I could have proven that. And you're really upset that somebody else got to put their name on it. Because you're like, if I was born 300 years earlier and, and studied mathematics at that time, I probably could have approved it. Not to, you know, crap on Lagrange at all. Like, dude was, you know, very smart, but still feels like, feels like I could have figured that one out. Okay, so from this, uh, immediately the book then goes into a couple of small results. And I do think that those ones are worth repeating. Um, yeah, that's right, exactly. He doesn't have enough stuff named after him. So he needs, he needs more stuff named after him. Okay, but immediately there's a whole bunch of crazy stuff that we can prove, right? Like stuff that um, uh, perhaps isn't immediately obvious, but with Lagrange's theorem, this relatively straightforward theorem, you immediately get all of these things as crawlers. So the first thing is uh, if uh, G is finite, and A is an element of G, then the order of A must also divide the order of G, right? And the proof is trivial. Look at the cyclic subgroup generated by A. We know that the order of that cyclic subgroup is the same as the order of A. That has to divide G, the order of G, right? So you're done, right? So we know that the order of A is the same thing as the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by A. And that thing has to divide the order of G by Lagrange's theorem. So we're done, right? It's like, I didn't even use full sentences uh, and without full sentences, like it's not even a one liner, it's a half of a liner, right? So that's kind of nice, that's sweet. But uh, from this, we can immediately also prove even stronger things. This is, this is a really nice result here that I'm about to do, which is basically, if you have a finite group of prime order, it has to be a cyclic group. Is P, and what I mean by here is this is a prime, then G is isomorphic to ZP. Okay, and think about how crazy this is. Like this is a huge theorem. Uh, all you have to do is know that the order of the group is a prime. So Z2 or, you know, order two, three, five, seven, 11, 13, whatever. And you immediately know, boom, it's abelian, right? Which shouldn't it all be obvious. It's abelian and it's cyclic, right? That's crazy. The proof is trivial. So, right, if A is an element of G, then the order of A must divide the order of G by our previous corollary, right? Every element of the group, its order must divide the order of the group. And so that means that it must divide P, right? Because the order of the group is prime. Well, there's only two options, right? By definition of a prime number, the only numbers which divide it are one or um, P, right? So that, well, the only element of order one is the identity. So either A is the identity, 
or the order of A is P. But if the order of A is P, then G is equal to. So if A is not the identity, oops, then G is generated by A, right? And thus is isomorphic to ZP. Right, that's a really powerful thing that we can do just simply because we know uh, Lagrange's theorem, right? So really, really powerful stuff that we can do uh, just with very little bit. Okay, let, let's, uh, what was the next one? I, I do think these ones are worth repeating because they are nice of just how many really quick and instantaneous things you can prove. Um, so if the order G is equal to N, so again, an implicitly the group is finite, then A to the N is equal to E for all A and G. Right? So definitely, if you raise anything to the power of the whole group, then you get the identity. We are actually going to use this a couple of times, so it is worth mentioning. Okay, um, so uh, fix some A in G. So that, what does that mean? So the order of A must divide the order of G, right? Which in this case is N, i.e. there exists K. in N such that uh, the order of A times K is equal to N. So if we take A to the power of N, right? This is the thing I'm trying to show that's the identity. Well, that's A to the order of A to the power of K, which is the identity to the power of K, which is the identity, voila. Right. And again, I don't know if this was obvious to you. Like, this is one of those things that I think that as you start, as you do more and more group theory, you start to begin to suspect that it's true. Right. Especially once you realize that, uh, and again, in some sense, this is obvious, right? Like, we know that the order of A must divide the order of the group. So, for example, let's say you have a group of order 12, and I give you an element, and it's, uh, you know, its order is four. Well, yeah, obviously, if I'm <clears throat> Excuse me. Obviously, if I raise that thing to the twelfth power, I'm going to get the identity because its order is four. So once I raise it to the fourth power, I get the identity, and certainly any multiple of four is also going to be the identity, right? So yeah, in some sense, that's that's very, very clear. Excuse me. I'm just going to mute for a second. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. <clears throat> I forgot to bring my water into my room, but I don't want to break the uh, break up the lecture just to go get my water. So I'm hoping I can make it to the break, but we'll see. I might have to bail and go and get my water. Okay, we're going to do one more, um, and then we're going to build off this, and we're going to prove something that's actually uh, very much related to this one as well. And so this is for Matt's little theorem, not his last theorem, right? So you have to be careful when you call things FLT because that could be either the little or the last uh, theorem. Uh, so this is if you know A is some natural number. Here we all assume that N is or A is a zero is not a natural number. Uh, let what's the exact theorem? And P is prime. then A to the P is congruent to A mod P, like so, okay? And this is something, if you take like a number theory course, you can just prove this. You don't have to use group theory in order to do this. So I don't know if anyone has taken, has anyone taken like the third year number theory course? I don't remember what it is, three something. That's not, not probably not super helpful. 315, is 315 the third year number theory? Oh, you did it in 202. Okay, just maybe by like some sort of counting argument, like a combinatorial argument instead. Maybe it does, in which case, um, then they would be doing it there. So I actually remember proving this 
in my first year proofs class, right? Like when I was an undergrad, we definitely did this without group theory. So uh, you definitely don't need any sort of group theoretic thing in order to be able to do this. When I was an undergrad, this was like uh, something we learned in 102, right? Like my, my where I went to undergrad. Um, so yeah, you definitely don't need group theory because we definitely didn't learn group theory in first year. Uh, okay, and how's this proof go? Basically what we're gonna do is we're really gonna lean on and leverage uh, the previous result, which says that if you raise anything to the power of the group, then you get back the identity. And then uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, again, really lean on the fact that we know that for ZP, the group of units uh, mod P, right, which we call UP, uh, has order P minus one, right? So suppose, or let me say this. So note that it suffices to show, and remember at the beginning of the year, uh, I was saying that kind of, especially when you're doing dis discrete group theory, you can't avoid the number theory, right? Like the two seem kind of very closely entwined. And again, you know, here's another example of us seeing it firsthand, right? So it suffices to show that a to, uh, a to the power of P minus A is congruent to zero mod P or equivalently, right? What does that mean? That means that P divides A to the P minus A, right? Right, that's the same thing, right? If you're congruent to zero mod p, remember that's the uh, congruency class of your relation, or, or sorry, of your remainder when you divide by p. And so saying that it's congruent to zero is the same thing as saying that there is no remainder, i.e. you divide perfectly. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna break this into cases. So case, suppose that p divides a. Okay, so if p divides a, we're done. Because if P divides A, then P divides A to the P minus A, right? And that's what we just said. That was equivalent to what we wanted to do. So we're done. Is everyone fine that if P divides A, P divides A to P minus A? And you can do that two ways. You can factor an A out of everything and say, yeah, if A to, you know, I can write A to the P minus A is A times A to the P minus one minus one, blah, 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 blah. I divide one of the factors, so I divide the product. Um, or... If P divides A, it also clearly divides A to the power of P. You divide both of the uh, elements of the summand, and therefore you divide the sum as well. Okay, both of those would work. Okay, so that was the first case. So now the second case this is the more interesting case. And that's when we suppose that P does not divide A. Okay, so in particular, they are co prime. Right? And so here we see that it's critical that we were prime. I'm really using that fact in order to say that A and P are co-prime. If P does not divide A, uh, well, the only way that a prime can divide a number is, well, no, no, let's, let's say it a different way. Um, remember when you do a bunch of GCD things, the way that you can often prove them is looking at the prime factorization of a number, right? So if P does not divide A, that means that P does not appear in the prime factorization of A anywhere. And so if P does not appear in the prime factorization of A, then P and A must be co-prime, right? That's just like a math 102 thing. So hopefully everyone's okay with that. Um, yeah, the, generally the only numbers that aren't co-prime to P are things that have a P explicitly in them, right? I.e. P must divide them. Okay, so that means that they're co-prime. So what this is going to mean is that A is in UP. or rather the equivalence class of A is in UP, right? Where here, remember this UP is, what else did we call it? Z sub P, you know, star, the, the group of multiplication under ZP, but we know that that's just isomorphic to ZP minus one. So thus uh, A is in here, right? Um, and we know that the order of UP is equal to p minus one. So we're gonna get that a to the p minus one, it has to be equal, or has to be congruent to one, right? Mod p, and that's it, we're done, right? This is what we wanted to show.
because now I, all I do, I mean, okay, you might argue this is not what we wanted to show, but if you look at this and then you look at what I wanted to show, you're like, oh yes, obviously they are the same because all I have to do now is multiply both sides by A, right? So if you multiply both sides by A, voila, you get the top equation. Okay, in fact, uh, the way that I've often seen uh, Fermat's little theorem stated is as this bottom part, right? Is that a to the p minus one is congruent to one mod p. Because I guess the case when p divides a to the p or when p divides a is kind of boring, it's kind of dumb. So yeah, I often see Fermat's little theorem more often stated as the bottom one, but the top one does technically include a bunch of extra cases in it. So whatever. Okay, so like voila, just with Lagrange's theorem. I mean, I guess you could say that, that we didn't directly use Lagrange's theorem here. What we did use is use uh, this fact, right? But we proved that fact, right? That's this corollary right here at the top of the screen here. If G, the order of G is N, then A to the N is the identity. That fact was using, use, uh, or proven using Lagrange's theorem, right? So Fermat's last theorem was a corollary of a corollary, like of a corollary, but all those corollaries eventually stemmed from Lagrange's theorem, which is why it's a theorem, right? Because it gave us so many results kind of immediately and for free. Uh, we'll prove something in a second, uh, which is very related to this. In fact, it's really, really easy to generalize Fermat's little theorem from here, right? So namely, instead of showing that a to the p is congruent to a mod p, where p is a prime, you can replace p with any number. So let's say that you replace it with n, right? Well, the theorem is not true if we just replace p by n everywhere, right? So I wouldn't get that a to the n is congruent to a mod n for any n. That's certainly false. Uh, but what would I get, right? So let's say that I wanted to generalize Fermat's little theorem. And let's say that I wanted to do this by saying a to some power is congruent to a mod n, and you don't know that n here is prime, what power would I put here? If you were to just you know, mimic and imitate this proof exactly, what do I have to put there instead in order to fix this theorem and generalize it? And this is something that group theory, I think, is going to give us. Like I don't, I'm trying to recall how the number theoretic proofs and the combinatorial proofs of this theorem go. And I don't think we'll immediately get the generalization of Fermat's little theorem here, but can anyone think what exponent should I take A to in order to get this result if I change the prime to being an arbitrary number? Like what, what was critical about the prime here? Okay, so in case one, primeness wasn't used at all, right? Uh, if I replace p with n, I would get if n divides a, then n divides a to the n minus a. Definitely, that's true, right? So the prime primality of p was not used in case one. So I need to replace primality in case two. I'm going to let you think about that, okay? See if you can generalize for Matt's uh, little theorem. This would be uh, a fun little exercise for you. Okay, I'm not going to give it to you. Um, okay, I think uh, maybe I don't I don't want to call it a corollary, but maybe let's say comment. And that's the fact that the index is actually multiplicative. Okay, so now we can actually prove this. So let's say comment note that if uh, maybe my alphabet's going to be screwed up here, k is a subgroup of h, which is a subgroup of g, then the index of k in g is equal to the index of g in h times the index of h in k. Does everyone believe that? I mean, I think that's the sort of thing that's not immediately obvious, but if you think about it for a bit, you can convince yourself that it's true. The proof is very, very quick, but you probably want an intuitive understanding, right? We're saying, are the number of cosets of K and G 
equivalent to the number of cosets of H and G times the number of cosets of K and H, like that's probably not obvious when you say it that way, right? I don't think that that's like super clear. Um, but in terms of if you actually draw a picture, I claim that the picture is clear, right? So let's say that this is G and let's say, you know, again, H is like this thing. Right, so this thing here, this is H. And then let's say that K maybe is even smaller than that. And this thing here, this is K, right? Okay, so the index of G and H, again, if you just think about things in terms of rectangles, or let's, sorry, let's think about the index of G and K. Okay, so the index of, or K and G rather, so that's going to look like, again, I'm going to use K to partition my space up, which is basically I'm just, you know, counting the number of blocks I can make uh, like this. Right. And I'm counting the number of squares here. Right. And that's the index of G and K. And the claim is that that is equal to. The index of G or of H and G. Right? Which is in this case is going to be four. It's the number of it's the number of columns in this picture that I have times the index of H in K, which I'm going to kind of draw it so that you can see the ambient group here, but the the index of H and K looks like this, right? So you get one, two, three, four, five. So the index of H and K, the way I've drawn it here, is five. And the index of H and G here is one, two, three, four. And if you multiply those two things, what do you get? Well, yeah, you get the total number. You get the total number of things. Right, do you agree that that, hopefully that picture sort of makes sense as to like why this is obviously true? That's the idea there, right? If you use H to partition your space and then you use K to partition H, that's the same thing as if you had used K and you multiply those two things, that's the same thing as if you had used K to partition your entire space, right? You just look at how many times K partitioned H, multiply that by the number of times H occurred in G and you get everything. So that's the reason for that. And the proof is trivial. Right? Literally just compute both sides. Uh, so we have by Lagrange's theorem, we have the order of G is the index of K and G times the order of K, right? Alternatively, it's this thing. And if we do this one more time, but this time using H, you know, K and H, so we would get G, H, H, K times the order of K. So these two things are equal, right? And if you divide both sides by uh, the order of K, which you know is not zero, right? Because the identity element at least has to be in there. So if you divide both sides by the order of K, then you get your result. G and H and H and K, right? Voila. So you're done. So there's kind of like an intuition you can use in order to understand why this formula is multiplicative. Again, the fact that this formula is multiplicative, if you go on and you take like 401, I guess it's 401, uh, which I think Ali is actually teaching next semester. So if you go on and you take that and it's like polynomials, uh, equations, and, fi and finite fields or whatever, or field theory, uh, you're going to learn a bit of Galois theory. And this is exactly the sort of thing that is covered there, right? And you'll learn that, yeah, this index is multiplicative in that con context as well, and ends up being really important and really critical in terms of giving you um, a bunch of cool things like the irreducibility of, or, or sorry, the solvability of quintic for, uh, equations, for example, right? Okay, so are there any uh, questions so far? Is everyone okay? Okay, not too bad. Okay, I am 
Yeah, there's so many questions here, which I'd love to do, but I need the quotient to do. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put up a little exercise and then I'm gonna run and grab my water bottle because I'm definitely gonna need it. So exercise. Okay, so I want you to take a, an opportunity and try and prove this. So if G is abelian, is a, well, let's say finite and abelian. If G is finite and abelian, and the order of G is odd, right? Uh, what do I wanna show? Every element of G, show that every element of G is a square. Okay, does that make sense? Does everyone understand what I mean by show that every element is a square? So for example, this is not true in Z, right? Maybe let me just give an example. So not true. Well, okay, actually, I guess it is uh right yeah so it's not true or i want to say let me maybe elaborate on what i mean by a square right so an element g in g is a square if there exists some other element h and g such that g is equal to h squared Right. And this is this is not unusual. We might call these things like perfect squares. If you think about like the integers, for example, we think we say four is a perfect square. Why? Because it is two times two. Right. It comes from it is the squaring of an element of the integers. Same thing. Uh, nine is a perfect square. Right. Sixteen is a perfect square. Twenty five is a perfect square. The number 20 is not a perfect square. Right. There is no integer that squares to give you 20. So what I'm asking you to show here is show that every element can be written as something else in the group squared. Does that make sense? Right? So that's what this exercise is saying. Suppose G is finite and abelian. The order of G is odd. Show that every element in the group is a perfect square, i.e. you can find something else in the group which squares to give you G. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of time to think about that, let's say like five minutes or so. In that five minutes, I'm going to go run and grab my uh, water bottle um, and then you know, we'll take this up and I'll show you how to do this. And this one I think is not too bad, but you have to think about it for a little bit. Okay. Um, all right. Five minutes. I'll be right back.
Okay, is anyone making any progress? Does anyone need a hint? So it occurs to me, right, that this might be your first time having to make this sort of argument before. Uh, and if that's true, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but that you might not actually know how to even start this, right? Uh, it's the sort of thing that like, if you start it, it's actually, if, if, if you see the correct way of approaching the problem, um, that it's not too bad. But if you don't see the, the, the correct way of starting the problem, it's not to say it's the only way, but that it can actually be quite tricky. Right. And the I think that the easiest way to do this problem is to look at a homomorphism. Right. So, uh, or I guess this is a solution. This isn't a proof. So, solution. So, what I would do is I would say define. from G to G as the map phi of G equals G squared, right? Okay, so this map is a, in fact a homomorphism. This is where the abelianness uh, property comes in. We don't actually need that it's a homomorphism, do we? Mm, I don't think so. Um, oh, no, no, we do for, for the proof I'm gonna use. So the, the abelianness uh, here is necessary for this to be a homomorphism, right? Because generally the squaring map is not a homomorphism. So since G is abelian, uh, phi is a homomorphism. Now, what you should be asking is, why do this, right? Like, why did I define this homomorphism and what do I wanna show, right? Like, uh, the idea is that having set this problem up like this, I claim that if I can prove something about phi, I'm done. So what do I want to prove about phi? All right, I want to show that every element is a square. I've got this homomorphism that sends an element to an you know to itself squared. What do I do? Any ideas? Okay, yeah, so it's an isomorphism and it will be, that's absolutely true. It is in fact an isomorphism or in this case, an automorphism. There's one particular property about being an isomorphism though is what I really, really want, right? So, uh, you know, for example, the fact that it's injective might be nice but isn't really what I'm after. What I want is uh, one particular aspect of bijectivity. I want surjectivity. Right. If we can prove that if phi is surjective, and, and note that being phi being surjective automatically makes it not an automorphism. But if I can prove that phi is surjective, I'm done. Right. And I want you all to think about that. If this map is surjective, we're done. Right. We've proven what we want to prove. Right. So it suffices to show. And so you're correct, absolutely, when you say we want to show bijectivity. That absolutely is correct. And it will be true if we prove surjectivity. But surjectivity is really what I want. Like you can imagine that if I, I gave you a similar question where it wasn't an, uh, an automorphism, like it didn't map from a group to itself, we could prove something similar by proving that this map was surjective, right? Because what does surjectivity mean? Surjectivity means that every element in G looks, uh, looks like phi of something, right? But phi of something is precisely the squaring map, right? So if we can show that every element in G is phi of something, that will mean that every element in G is H squared for some element of H, right? So I wanna show that it's surjective. Now, exactly your idea of showing that it's an isomorphism, I'm really gonna leverage the fact that both the domain and the codomain have exactly uh, the same size, right? And the way that I'm going to do this is that proving, you, you might say, well, okay, sure, let's prove that this map is surjective. You really haven't like made our lives any easier. You've just reframed the problem now using homomorphisms and, and potentially actually made it more confusing. So what I'm actually going to do, so it suffices to show that phi is surjective, for which it also suffices to show that phi is injective. For which it also suffices 
to show that phi is injective, right? So this is one of those properties that I used a lot when we were first talking about automorphisms. I know the domain and the codomain have exactly the same cardinality, right? They have exactly the same number of elements, which means that any injective map between these two uh, functions has to also be surjective and vice versa, right? You are surjective if and only if you're injective and you are injective if and only if you are surjective. And that is precisely because both elements have, ex or, or both the domain and codomain have exactly the same cardinality, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to prove that this map is injective. That will prove to me that it is surjective. And once I have surjectivity, I'm done. Okay. So now in order to do this, what I'm going to do is the following. So, you know, let's pick an element in the kernel of phi. This is why I needed to be a homomorphism, right? So let, let's say G uh, be in the kernel of phi. Right, so if G is not the identity, well, what does that mean? So that means that phi of G equals G squared is the identity. So the order of G is two, right? Why is that not allowed? Why can the order of G not be equal to two? Look at the exercise, what property have we not used yet? Come on, you know this. Right, exactly. The order of G is odd. So two doesn't divide it, right? So thus, we would have that the order of G, which is equal to two, must divide the order of big G, but big G is odd. So this isn't possible. It is not possible. So that means the G has to be the identity. So that shows that the kernel is trivial. And we're done. Okay, so this is a proof that I think is, what do I wanna say? The, the proof of this fact is trivial once you figured out what it is you actually want to show. And the trickiness of this proof is figuring out what the right thing to show is, right? So the first thing I did was define this homomorphism, which was the squaring map. I said it suffices to show the squaring map is surjective, for which it also suffices to show that the squaring map is injective. And then, okay, let's prove it's injective because it's a homomorphism. Suppose that there's a non-trivial uh, element of the, of the kernel. Well, if there was a non-trivial element, that would be an element of order two, which contradicts the fact that G is odd and we're done. So unfortunately, I think it's kind of easy again to lose the forest for the trees, right? Because there were kind of so many equivalent things. We just kept reducing this to a simpler problem until we got to something that we were able to prove. But try and you know keep track of the steps that we used in order to say, oh, okay, this is equivalent to what I want to show. And now I'm in a position where I can do it. OK, I, I don't think that that, you know, I gave you five minutes to do that. I'm not certain uh, if that's fair in the sense that this is a, a, a question that I think requires either a lot of mathematical maturity or a little bit of um, a little bit of thinking. Right. I think if I gave some of you enough time, like if this were an assignment question, many of you would be able to come up with it. Um, but in five minutes, you know, is maybe a little bit unfair. But I wanted you to give you a chance to do it on your own before we started it. Okay, so are there any questions about that? Maybe let me have the whole thing on screen so you can see it. It's okay. All right. Well, if there are no issues with that, I wanna do another one. This one's going to be very similar to uh, Fermat's little theorem. Okay, uh, so what I wanna do here is the following. So suppose that A and N are both natural numbers. Okay, so we're not gonna let, oh, why is G squared equal to the identity? Absolutely, so uh, we suppose that G was in the kernel of phi, right? Now, by definition, phi of G is equal to G squared. So this one's just, this is the definition of phi. And then this part right here, the fact that 
phi is equal to the identity is because G is in the kernel of phi. Right, does that make sense? So uh, remember, right, what does phi do? Phi maps G to G squared, and you're an element of the kernel if you actually map to the identity. So it's the combination of those things that gave me G squared as the identity, yeah. No problem. Okay, so suppose that uh, A and N are natural numbers. Uh, and again, we're going to take zero is not a natural number for the purpose of this question, right? We don't want to worry about zero. Show that N always divides phi A to the N minus one, okay? And phi here is the euler totient function, right? It's our usual phi, where we figure out how many things are co-prime to a to the n minus one. So this is going to be very similar to Fermat's little theorem, and you should treat it as such. And I think that this is a surprising result. Like, I don't think, like, you know, it works out you can actually check it if you want to try different uh, values of uh, a and n. So for example, you know, if a is equal to three and n is equal to four, then phi of uh, three to the four minus one, that's phi of 80, right? And phi of 80, so 80 is two to the, what is it? 80, 10, so it's two to the four, so it's 16 times five, right? So two to the four times five, so that's gonna be 80 times one half, times I think four fifths, did I do this right? So that's going to be 32, right? And 32 is congruent to zero mod four, right? Four divides 32, right? And four does divide 32. And I think like, if you were to look at this equation again, you'd be like, uh, okay, sure, if I plug in different numbers of A and N, that certain seems to be okay. It does seem to check out. But like, how the hell would you prove that this thing is true? Okay, right? I don't think that there's any way in which this is like an obvious statement whatsoever. Nonetheless, with the things that we've learned so far, and especially sort of imitating our proof of Fermat's last theorem, we're going to be able to come up with something along these lines, okay? So what I think that we should do is... Uh, I've set this up. I'm going to give you uh, a little bit of a hint to get you started because I think it's not obvious unless you um, you kind of know what the hint is. We'll take our break. Plus, I'll give you maybe an extra five minutes to work on it. So we'll kind of take a break for like 15 minutes or so here. And then when we come back, I'll take up this. Um, and then we'll do, you know, I think one last problem. Uh, and then we'll probably finish off the lecture. Okay, but let me give you the hint for this one on what to do. Uh, because, yeah, like I said, I think this is a really tricky one if you don't know where to start. Uh, so let me give you the hint. Okay. And the hint is to look at A in U A to the N minus one, right? And determine. the order of A, okay? So uh, Fermat's little, I hope I said little theorem and, and, and not last theorem. Yeah, I hope I said little theorem, right? Because otherwise, yeah, Fermat's last theorem is definitely well beyond the scope of this course. But I might've said last, I might've said, uh, just slipped up there and said last theorem, okay? But look at Fermat's little theorem, right? That was the one that we did, that was the last, right here, right? So it's the proof of this one right here, this corollary, Fermat's little theorem, right? So look at that proof. Um, and, and actually here, let me leave it here for a second. So if you need to scrap, like snap a screenshot or something, um, before I, I kind of go back to the problem statement, you might want to just snap a screenshot up here. It's not exactly the same. It's not like you're just going to be able to word for word adapt it, but it's the same sort of idea where you're looking at, um, you know, something in the group of units in this big U. Right. Okay. So hopefully you have a screenshot or something. You you know you used your phone or or snapped um, something. Uh, okay. So now we want to prove this thing, which again doesn't look quite the same. It look it looks a little bit similar, but but not exactly the same. 
the hint here is to say, again, look at A in U, A to the N minus one. So first of all, you have to convince yourself that A is even in there, right? That namely that A is co-prime to A to the N minus one, but you can prove that it's not too hard. So once you know that A is in there, find the order of A, okay? And if you can find the order of A, then you're done, all right? Uh, so that's my hint to you. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, in theory, give you both five minutes and we'll take our 10 minute break here. So uh, we'll, you know, we'll take a 15 minute break, five minutes for you to work on this and then 10 minutes because we're at that point anyway. So by my watch, it's 2.03 uh, right now. So why don't we come back at 2.18 and I'll take this one up and then we'll do one last problem. Okay, and again, don't hesitate, throw if you have any questions or if you need more hints, uh, don't hesitate to throw them in the chat. Uh, I will be around and I will look at the chat just to make sure uh, everything's okay and to answer questions as they might come up. Okay, so 15 minutes starting here uh, and I'll see you in a little bit. Okay, everyone, it's been 15 minutes. Um, hopefully you managed to make some progress on this. It kind of depends on how rigorous I think you wanna be, right? Because uh, I think at some point you can just be like, oh yes, this is trivially true or something along these lines, but let's give it a shot. Okay, so the first thing that I wanna do is argue that A is in U A to the N minus one, right? So we wanna show or maybe let me say claim. So claim A is in U A to the N minus one, right? Namely, the GCD of A and A to the N minus one is equal to one, right? So that's the first thing that I wanna prove. And indeed this is true. So as a proof of this, so suppose that D divides A and D divides A to the N minus one like so, right? Well, if D divides A, D divides any power of A as well. So that means that D must divide A to the N minus A to the N minus one i.e. d divides one. So every divisor of both a and a to the n minus one must divide one, i.e. the biggest, or there's only two numbers that really do that, one and negative one. The GCD is the biggest of those two numbers, so it's equal to one. Right, so these two numbers are in fact co-prime. You probably suspected that that was true anyway, but that's the proof of it. <clears throat> So A is in fact an, a, a unit in Z mod A to the N minus one. So now the only thing we need to do is look at its order. Well, immediately we know that A to the N minus one is definitely congruent to zero mod A to the N minus one, right? I think everybody agrees with that. Um, and of course, if we move the one onto the other side, that means a to the n is congruent to one mod n, right? So what we wanna actually show that n here is the order of a. So claim the order of a is equal to n in this group. So we know that a to the n is congruent to one, that's a good sign, but we don't necessarily know that it is the uh, smallest number which does this, right? It could be that a squared is the identity and here I've claimed that a to the four is the identity. So it's possible that a smaller number works. But on the other hand, and again, this is where I'm saying like how difficult this is depends on how trivial you're willing to say, uh, this, and, and I, I will prove it kind of more algebraically, but I think I would be fine if at this point you said, yeah, clearly look at the yellow rectangle, uh, N 
is the smallest number for which a to the n minus one is congruent to zero mod a to the n minus one, right? No smaller number could possibly make this equation true other than n itself, right? Um, but yeah, listen, let's prove it. So we wanna show that n is actually the smallest number for which a to the n is congruent to one mod n. So uh, for the proof of this, uh, suppose that uh, the, yeah, let's suppose that a to the d is congruent to one mod a to the n minus one, right? So that is a to the n minus one must divide a to the power of d minus one. Uh, of course, we can just add one to both sides of that. So that implies that a uh, to the n must divide a to the power of d. Um, and if that's true, um, then uh, n, what do I want? n must be less than or equal to d, right? Or in particular, d must be greater than or equal to n. Right? And so n is the smallest number that works. Right, and we're done. Uh, so now we've shown that the order of A is equal to N. Well, what does that give us? Well, remember the order of an element must divide the order of the group, right? So finally, N, which is equal to the order of A, must divide U A to the N minus one. And that we know is exactly equal to the euler totian function. And so if you kind of ignore this middle stuff and you just kind of look at this, we get our answer, like so. OK? So again, all I needed to do, I know that phi a to the n minus 1. And, and anytime you see the Euler totian function, this is a good suggestion that you should probably work in u a to the n minus 1, right? Because you know that the Euler totian function, it precisely tells you the order of that group. I'm oh, sorry, I should put the order of u a to the n minus 1 here. So you know that the Euler totian function is the order of that group. And if you want to prove some sort of divisibility relation that suggests that, oh, just prove that there exists an element in that, um, prove, prove that there exists an element in that group uh, with the order that you want, right? And you kind of, everything sort of falls apart from there. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions about that? So it's not very long, but you kind of have to like think about it in the right frame of mind, right? And like I said, any, especially in this class and especially uh, anything after Lagrange's theorem, if you see some sort of condition about phi and the euler totian function, your brain should go, oh, maybe I should do something with the U group, right? The group of units, just as a, a nice little problem solving technique there, okay? Uh, one thing that I actually wanted to mention, so the book does a great job of this, and what the book says is like, hey, listen, the converse of Lagrange's theorem, Lagrange's theorem isn't true, right? Um, if you have a uh, group, you know that every subgroup must divide the order of the big group, right? The order of H must divide the order of G. The converse is not true. Not every divisor will necessarily have um, a subgroup of that size. Right, so the first example of this was an A4. A4 is a group of order 12. And even though six divides 12, there is no subgroup of order six, right? So, okay, fine. Uh, but there is a partial converse. Now we don't have, and I don't think we ever will, unfortunately in this class, give, uh, be able to give you the partial converse. But the partial converse goes like this. Every prime divisor of the order of group does have a subgroup of that size. Okay, so if I give you a group of, let's say, tw uh, size, let's do size 12, right? Every prime divisor of 12 uh, does have a subgroup of that size in it. So in this case, this would be two, three, is that it? I guess that's it, right? Those are the only prime divisors of 12. Did I miss an obvious one? No, that's it. So there is a subgroup of order two and there is a subgroup of order three. Same thing if you took, you know, uh, a much bigger number, like 
I don't know, 50, find all the prime divisors of 50, you are guaranteed that they're actually subgroups of that size. However, in order to be able to prove that theorem, you need something called the CELO of theorems. And we do not, for whatever reason, talk about the CELO of theorems in this class, which trust me, I'm very happy for. I hate the CELO of th theorems. Um, yet, nonetheless, they are a, an important part of the classification of finite uh, groups. So if you kind of go take a, a typical group theory class, they often do show up. But if that is something that is interesting to you, you can Google them, right? Look up on like Wikipedia what the CELOW theorems are, S-Y-L-O-W. You know, I'll put it in the chat so you can look them up. So the CELOW theorems, there are three of them, uh, and they're crazy. They're just insanely powerful uh, and, and very interesting theorems. But And we need those in order to be able to prove that for every prime divisor of the order of a group, there is a subgroup of that size, OK? Uh, so yeah, just take a look at that if you want a partial converse to Lagrange's theorem. Now, the last thing I want to do, and uh, yeah, I'm not going to lie. I think this is a kind of a weird place to talk about this result. Um, it is in the book, and in the book it says it's left as an exercise. It's, it's kind of a fun exercise, but in some sense it's also uh, very trivial once you know something a little bit stronger called the second isomorphism theorem. I guess this theorem is actually more general. So theorem or proposition. So if G uh, is a group, probably finite group, but who cares? If G is a group and H and K are subgroups of G, then the number of elements in HK, which is itself not a group, is equal to the number of elements in H times the number of elements in K divided by the number of elements in H. Intersect K like this, okay? And let me just write out what HK is just in case nobody remembers it. It is what you expect. Okay, it is the set of elements that can be written as something in H times something in K, right? That's, that's just what HK means. Right? So it's the set of things in H times the set of things in K. And what our claim is, is that the number of elements uh, that can be written as something in H times something in K is equal to this terrible formula over here on the right-hand side. Okay, It's the number of elements in H times the number of elements in K divided by the intersection. And again, there's a sense in which if you think about this geometrically, uh, this is not a crazy result, right? Like that this is very reasonable. Uh, so you know that is a theorem. And again, it is kind of worth uh, pointing out that in general, this is not a group or not a subgroup. Okay, there will be special occasions in which it is a subgroup, but we need extra conditions on K. I think it's K, it might be H, but I'm pretty sure it's K. Um, and we're gonna learn about these in the coming weeks. We need something uh, called normality. So we need that one of these groups is a normal subgroup, and that is a an extra condition on top of the subgroup condition, but we don't have that yet, okay? So right now we're just saying this thing as a set is equal to this complicated formula. And believe it or not, the way that you actually can prove this is by looking at cosets, all right? So this is totally the sort of theorem I, I don't think any of you have a chance of proving, at least not without a scaffolding it a lot more, right? And saying like, prove this and then prove this and then prove this, et cetera. Uh, so I'm going to prove it for you. The first thing that I'm going to do is I have the following claim. So my claim is that H, actually, I'm just going to claim that these are equal, not even just in cardinality, that these are equal as sets. Okay. So my claim here is that the left cosets of uh, K, where you can take elements from HK is the same as the left cosets of K, where you just take elements from H. Okay, so that's that's kind of more or less my claim here. Um, and the fact that this is true is not too hard to prove. Right, so we'll do a double subset inequality. So let uh, HK, this is a little h and a little k. So let HK be an element of HK so that 
if I take a look at the coset that that generates, that's equal to H times K, K. That's equal, now K is in K, right? Little K is in big K. So this is just the identity coset. So this whole, the, you know, the coset generated by little h, little k is just the same coset as uh, the one generated by h. That's exactly an h k, right? So thus, that gives us one inequality. Okay, and then conversely, so let's say uh, pick some little h in h so that h times k is the same thing as h times e times k, where here I'm thinking of e as being in the group k, right? And that, so this is, yeah, definitely in h k mod k like this, right? So that gives us the opposite inequality. Okay, so these two things are equal as cosets, as, as groups of, or as sets of cosets. Okay, so that's our first result. Now, the second claim is that what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this. So I'm gonna take H mod K into H mod H intersect K. And the way that I'm gonna do this is like this, and I claim that this map is a bijection. Okay, so does everyone understand what I'm saying this map does? I'm saying if you give me a coset on the left side, remember that's what H divided by K means, right? It's the collection of cosets HK. So if you give me a coset, eight, little h capital K, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that H and stick it in front of H intersect K. Right, so that's what I'm doing. And I claim that this map is actually a bijection, right? Every single element that I could want on the right-hand side um, appears as an something on the left-hand side and it does so injectively, okay? So I claim that this map is a bijection and from that we'll almost be done, right? Like once we have this result, we're almost uh, fully completed. So does everyone understand what I'm trying to prove here? Hopefully that's not too crazy. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so the proof of this fact, now the first thing we have to do is prove that this map is well-defined. Can anyone tell me why? Why do I have to prove that this map is well-defined? Do you remember what well-defined means, right? I wanna show. that if H1K is equal to H2K, then F, or sorry, we've been calling it phi. Why is my eraser not working all of a sudden? Oh, there we go. Then phi of H1K equals phi of H2K. Okay, so we have to prove this because we know that it's possible to get the same coset from two different H's, right? It's possible for H1 and H2 to be different, but for them to generate the same coset so that H1K is equal to H2K. And so what I need to prove is that this is, the definition of phi does not depend on whether I took H1 or H2, right? So if I took H1, I should get the same coset H1 times h intersect k as if I had taken h2, right? So I have to prove that this map is well-defined. Now, this isn't terribly difficult, right? And usually well-defined in this proofs are not difficult. So um, suppose that h1k is equal to h2k. So in particular, we know that this means that h1 inverse h2 is in k. Thus, H1 inverse H2 is an element of K, but since H1 and H2 are both elements of H, big H, and is also a group, that means that H1 inverse H2 is also an element of H. So since H is a group, 
H1 inverse H2 is also in H. And both of these facts combined tell us that H1, H2 is in both H and K, right? So it's in the intersection. And that means they generate the same coset. So phi of H1, K is equal to H1, H intersect K is going to be H2, H intersect K, and that's phi of H1, K, like so. Okay, so that does well-definedness. Uh, then we need to show uh, injectivity, right? Which in some sense is the converse of well-definedness. So injectivity. Right, and as usual for that one, we are going to assume that these two things are equal, right? So suppose that uh, phi of H1, K is equal to phi of H two K, and then I want to show that these are actually the same coset, i.e. H one H intersect K is equal to H two H intersect K. Okay, but basically I'm going to repeat the well-definedness proof, but kind of do it backwards, right? So the fact that these two things are equal. Tells me that H1 inverse H2 is in H intersect K. But of course, H intersect K is a subset of K, right? So that means that H1K is equal to H2K. Thus, they came from the same coset. So phi is injective. Okay. Surjective is trivial, literally nothing to do. Right? You say, give me H times H intersect K. What maps to that? Well, HK, right? Just look at what the definition of phi does. If you give me a coset on the right-hand side, write it as H times H intersect K. Obviously, HK maps to that, right? So it's absolutely trivial. Um, and so we're done, right? So uh, thus phi is a bijection. And since it's a bijection, this means that their cardinalities are the same. Right? I don't know why it looks like my screen is a little bit slow here. Okay. And uh, what I'm going to then do is multiply both sides by K. So using the fact that this is also equal to, so, or here, let, maybe let me write this. So let me get H K over K. It's the same thing as H over, or uh, I want to multiply by K, sorry, times the order of K is equal to H over K times K. That's equal to, uh, H times K over H intersect K. And now, uh, why isn't my thing scrolling up? Now this thing here is equal to H K over K times the order of K. And by Lagrange's theorem, that's just the same thing as H K. And so if I put all of this together, so thus H K is the order of H times the order of K divided by H intersect K like that. Okay, so yeah, that, that's a little bit of work, right? Like I don't think that that's uh, immediate 
and that you would think to do that. And there are a couple of ways of doing this. You can just kind of do it from a counting argument viewpoint. Um, but like, I'm necessarily trying to, not necessarily, I'm avoiding the combinatorical argument because, you know, this is a group theory class. So let's use a group theoretic argument. Um, well, I guess, you know, despite the fact that I've written it as phi, it's not a group homomorphism. It really is just a bijection because we haven't talked about, you know, imposing group structures on cosets yet. But yeah, this is how you do it. Okay. So uh, you now get that this theorem is true. Uh, we're going to see something like this, I think, when we talk about I think we're going to talk about the second isomorphism theorem in, in this class. We'll see. But um, eventually, when we start talking about quotients, where we're going to learn something about the second isomorphism theorem, this is effectively just a restatement of the second isomorphism theorem. Uh, and then, we, so when we get to that point, I'll kind of try and remind us of this fact that we had talked about this. But yeah, this is this is how this proof goes. Okay, so are there any questions about this? Okay, well, again, if you're typing a question, then uh, you know, don't hesitate to continue typing. Otherwise, I think that's gonna finish it for today. Uh, so we don't have anything else. We can finish class you know, 15 minutes early or so. Uh, and yeah, you're free to take off and hopefully, I know that this was a very proof intensive day, right? So this is the sort of thing that like kind of threw you off and you're just like, oh man, there were so many proofs. That's okay. Just take a second, kind of go slowly. Um, and see, you know, maybe start on the worksheet for Thursday, you know, that we're going to take up on Thursday and just make sure that you've got a solid grasp of what it is that this is talking about. Because the important thing here is not just Lagrange's theorem itself, which is of course super important and super useful, but all of those, those four corollaries or so that we immediately got from Lagrange's theorem, because we're going to use those freely from now on. So, uh, you know, keep in mind both Lagrange's theorem and those corollaries that sort of immediately came from it. And I think that that'll help a lot. Um, and, then, and then do a lot of examples, right? And try and make sure that you can prove all the things that you wanna prove. All right, everyone. Okay, otherwise I think I'm good. I think I'm done for the day. Uh, naturally, this is, are also my office hours. Like we're, you know, they start at three. Um, so I'm gonna hang around for anyone who has any questions. Otherwise, feel free to take off and I will see you all on Thursday. See ya.